So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you all for today's Endocrinology Grand Rounds. Um, our title of our topic today is a, a focus on smart insulin pens and clinical tips on using CGM during exercise. Um, and clinical tips on using CGM during exercise. Um, our presenters today are Erin Newkirk and Jonathan White. Erin um, is a clinical pharmacist in our, our endocrinology clinic. She completed her pharmacy school at UW-Madison and uh, subsequently residency training at uh, William S. Middleton Veterans Memorial Hospital at also in Madison. She has been working with us in endocrine clinic for the past 10 years and is currently sp spending most of her time working with patients with diabetes who um, require um, diabetes technology. She has a passion for improving diabetes outcomes and is a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Welcome, Erin. And uh, Jonathan, who will be um, also leading one of the sessions today. Um, he's also a clinical pharmacist in our um, endocrinology clinic. Um, he graduated from Midwestern University Chicago College of Pharmacy, uh, followed by residency training at St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center in Boise, Idaho, and family medicine and academia residency in University of Colorado Skag School of Pharmacy. Uh, Jonathan's interests lie in ASCVD risk reduction, type 1 diabetes, uh, preceptor development, um, resident education, and critical literature evaluation. So both of uh, them have been in our clinic and have been invaluable partners uh, of our care with, uh, of patients with diabetes. So today they're going to talk to us on smart insulin pens and clinical tips on using CGM during exercise. Erin and Jonathan. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending this afternoon. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Kadambi. Um, I will um, first remind everyone that at the end, um, if you have time to stay on um, in the small groups, Jonathan and I will lead um, utilizing the InPen app and the InPen itself. So I'm not sure if everyone uploaded the InPen app to their phone. Um, you can try to um, add that now or at any point um, if you didn't do that yet. Um, and if you don't have time to stay on, that's fine too. Um, to go over the objectives of what we're gonna talk about today is really understand the smart insulin pen technology and which of our patients would benefit from it. And then look at continuous glucose monitoring data before, during, and after exercise to help prevent glycemic variability. And then we will um, stop and break out into small groups and go over two cases and one, um, group will be led by Jonathan, and then one group will be led by myself. So in terms of insulin delivery options, our role is really to identify the right technology for the right person at the right time. And so traditionally, you know, we're used to most of our patients using now, hopefully at least insulin pens. Um, some still use a vial and syringe. We now have options of basic patch pumps like Vigo or even inhaled insulin. And then, of course, we have um, insulin pumps and even smart insulin pumps. Out of the 7 million patients um, that have diabetes, only about 30% of patients with type 1 use a pump, and even less than 1% with type 2 use a pump. And so I think we need some more advancements in technology, which um, smart insulin pens can kind of fill that gap in terms of being less costly um, and less complex for our patients. And so utilizing our certified diabetes care and education specialist to really go over the pros and cons out of all the different ways to deliver insulin and help determine which makes sense for that patient is really important. There's a lot of um, challenges that we experience with using multiple daily injections. Um, patients often can miss insulin doses and there's uh, data that shows even missing two insulin doses per week can lead to an increased A1C of 0.4%. So some of our patients are unintentionally missing, but maybe life's busy and they don't know if they inject it or not. And so they're in this kind of dangerous quandary of deciding whether to give another injection, um, which maybe they didn't before, or maybe they did. And so if they did, they're going to be at higher risk for lows. And then if they didn't, of course, their glucose is going to go up. Um, and then there's patients that, of course, intentionally omit due to embarrassment, inconvenience, or whatever it may be. And so this definitely impacts their overall glucose control. 
there's also some data that shows that a lot of patients have difficulty calculating their insulin doses, um, making it challenging um, for them. And so if they're a little bit confused or not sure what to do, they're going to underestimate. And of course, that's going to lead to higher glucose as well. There's concerns with patients' insulin stacking. And so there's a report that showed that 60% of insulin doses are actually taken when sim insulin is on board. So, of course, stacking up insulin is going to increase the risk for hypoglycemia as well. Um, and then us as providers, as we're reviewing the data, we really need to know when and how much insulin they ta had taken. And so we don't have that information. And so utilizing a smart insulin pen can work through all of these um, challenges. And the smart insulin pens have actually been available for the past decade. It's really been slow to adapt the use, but I think they're definitely starting to pick up more and more. Um, there's just a few clinical studies that look at the benefits of improving adherence and lowering A1C, as, as well as increasing time and range. Um, and then we have our guidelines um, that are now writing in their guidelines that supporting the use of smart insulin pens. So the ADA recommends it to help with dose capture and dosing recommendations. And then the American um, Association of Clinical Endocrinology also recommends um, based on anyone being on three or more injections of insulin a day. So we have uh, two options that are FDA approved. Uh, we're gonna spend the majority of the time talking about the in-pen, uh, but the other available in-pen that was FDA approved by um, in May of 2021 is BigFit Unity. Um, unfortunately, they're doing a really slow release, and so we do not have access to prescribe this Bigfoot Unity pen at this time. Um, but we'll walk through um, a few points about the Bigfoot Unity pens and kind of discuss some of the similarities and differences uh, with the in pen. All right, so getting into some of the basics with the Smart Insulin Pen in pen. It's really nice because it offers the option to do 0.5 unit dosing, um, and then will allow per dose be up to 30 units. So if someone's on higher amounts of insulin, they would have to do two injections if they're dosing more than 30 units. Um, it's compatible with Humalog, Novolog, and Epidra, and insulin cartridges would need to be ordered. So if they're previously using a pen, you have to prescribe the cartridges. And then when you prescribe the in-pen, it also, you need to pay attention to whether you're ordering the Lily in-pen or the Novo. So if they're on Humalog, you're going to have to order the Lily pen versus Novolog and Epidra. You would order the Novo pen. Don't need to order pen needles. Uh, the life of the pen is one year, and it doesn't need to be charged. It um, has a one-year battery life. For anyone to be able to use the pen, they have to have a compatible um, smartphone. Um, it is available via Apple or Android. I often recommend ordering two pens, um, so that way someone has it at work or school and then at home, as you can pair multiple pens with one app. Um, for anyone working in the endocrinology department, um, sending a prescription for that in-pen, the rapid-acting insulin cartridge, and then the pen needles to our freighter pharmacy can be done similar to how we do the continuous glucose monitoring process. Um, where we can place the referral to the MPA team, and then in those prescriptions, just write in the pharmacy notes MT MPA team, and they can help with the coverage um, for the in-pen. In terms of glucose um, monitoring compatibility, uh, the in-pen actually was initially started by a company called Companion Medical, but in the recent year, Medtronic has bought in-pen, and so it has the best compatibility with the Medtronic Guardian Connect. Um, I don't think we have many patients using standalone um, Medtronic uh, continuous glucose monitoring, but if we did, it's really nice features because it um, continuously populates the glucose data. And then as they're looking at their in pen app, app, the glucose information is shown real time on the graph versus if someone is using the Dexcom, that information isn't populated until 10 minutes after input and then it won't show up on their um, glucose graph until on the in-pen app until three hours. There's a delay. And then there's no compatibility with the graph um, in terms of anyone using a freestyle Libre. In terms of the dosing calculator, um, there's three different modes that can be selected for our patients. Uh, there's 
data that shows using an automated dosing calculator can reduce A1C by 0.7 to 1%, which can be pretty significant. The three different options are carb counting, meal estimation, and fixed dose. The carb counting is kind of set up similar to how we would set up someone on an insulin pump. Um, so you have your insulin to carb ratio, your insulin sensitivity factor, um, target glucose, and all that. Meal estimation would be set up based on coming up with units for a low carb, medium carb, and high carb meal, and that can be different based on each meal, breakfast, lunch, and, and uh, dinner. And so depending upon what meal they're at, so if they were eating, um, say, in a medium carb uh, meal at breakfast, it would just come up with the amount that they, of insulin sh they should give just by selecting those two options. And then the fixed dose option is kind of similar to our sliding scale, if you will, um, where the fixed dose would be like the base dose. And so you would set that up uh, based on each meal of breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. For all three of the therapy modes, uh, they can be set up to have an insulin sensitivity factor, as well as that target glucose and active insulin time. And so one trick that I've learned is I usually like to start with everyone selecting the carb counting um, mode when I set this up because based on FDA ruling, if someone is on fixed dose and meal estimation and you wanna transition them to carb counting, there needs to be a new order placed. And so if I'm starting someone on the other fixed dose or meal estimation, but think they're gonna move to carb counting, it's just easier to set that up just quick as carb counting and um, just by selecting that and then changing it to the one you actually plan to use at that time, knowing that you can um, move to the carb counting in the future. In terms of what the app actually looks like and what can be individualized, um, this slide kind of shows the different options of the calculator setup based on carb counting, meal estimation, and fixed dose. Um, as I said, all three of these modes have the duration of insulin um, option. Uh, the target glucose, that insulin sensitivity factor, and they can be, you can set up um, three different, um, three or four different, I think it's four different time periods um, based on different targets or different insulin sensitivity factor as well. In terms of what the patients would actually see on the app, um, there's a lot of different reminder options, and so uh, one of the biggest things is they can set meal dose reminders, and so they would figure out a meal dose window of time. So say the earliest they'd eat breakfast was six, and the latest would be nine. They can set up to three different dose um, reminders for meals, and then at the end of that dosing period, they would be alerted um, if they hadn't entered a dose. There's also long-acting insulin reminders, so patients would still have their typical um, basal insulin through their pen or their vials and syringe or however they're using that, uh, but they can program into the app how much they're taking and then set that time and they can get a reminder and manually log that. So that can be um, documented on the report as well. There's options to set up a blood glucose check reminder as well. And then there's some alerts, which looks at insulin expiration, also the temperature of insulin, making sure it's not too hot or cold. And then if someone's using the Medtronic Guardian, um, there is low blood glucose assist as well. In terms of sharing data with all of us, um, we're really used to going to a portal to uh, re review reports. And in pen, it's set up differently. So on the bottom of the app, um, here's kind of what's on the home page, essentially. There's home, logbook, reports, and settings. So they would go to reports. And then in the upper left corner, um, they can select different time frames. It defaults to 14 days, and that's usually what I look at. And then I always ask patients to make sure they push the refresh, um, those circling arrows there, because if they don't do that, it'll send an old report. And then um, they would go to the share button, um, which is on the farthest right there, and they can either send the report via um, fax. And once they put the fax number in there, it's remembered or they can save it um, to their phone on a file and then attach it to a MyChart document. And so I think really continuing to get our patients engaged and trying to have the medical assistance pre-chart to make sure we have the data that we need is important as well as us trying to you know, hold the patients accountable as well. So we're gonna spend the next few slides talking about what's on the report. 
Um, the nice thing about the in-pen report, um, especially if you're selecting 14 days, is it's only three pages. So there's a first page with, with um, a bunch of different information, and then you go into the daily chart. So looking at the top of the first page, there is the um, statistics section. So we're used to looking at a lot of these reports with the time um, within range. It gives the average glucose and then how often they're within range or above or below. Then the next circle looks at the number of missed doses. And I always like to pair that up with the number of um, rapid acting insulin doses per day because maybe um, their meal time windows aren't set or maybe they're skipping some meals and not really needing to dose insulin. And so um, that doesn't always tell the full story, but at least can clue you in to ask some additional questions. And then the next circle tells us the um, bolus calculator usage and then whether they're using it based on the doses advised or if they're giving a higher dose than advised or a lower dose than advised. And then the last, um, circle on the right for the statistics section breaks down the amount of long-acting insulin and rapid-acting insulin and um, tells us the total daily dose. And then underneath that is the modal day glucose graph, and this is similar essentially to an ambulatory glucose profile. For patients that um, are using a blood glucose meter, you're going to see it look like this with all these little um, entries from glucose uh, readings and then looking at from 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. for that time period. And then below that will tell you the, um, the calculator settings based on time of day. So this patient is either set up on meal estimation or fixed dose um, since there's no insulin to carb ratio listed there um, for their settings. And then moving on on the report, there's a long acting insulin assessment, um, which really can be helpful. It summarizes where their glucose um, is when they're fasting, um, where it was when they went to bed and what that changes. Uh, there's definitely recommendations that if the bedtime to fasting glucose is changing by more than 30, that there needs to be a change in that long acting insulin dose. Uh, it also summarizes the number of days that their glucose is going below 70, which can be helpful. And then the last section of that first page of the report is the meal assessment. And so you can look at each time of day based on their meal. Um, this report shows an example of a, someone on a meal um, estimation. So it breaks it down based on low carb, medium carb, and high carb, and then for that breakfast meal and then where the glucose is trending to see how well those, um, that dosing calculator is set up. So moving on to the daily charts. Um, so this can be helpful to really get into more of the nitty gritty of the report. Um, you can definitely identify how well someone is um, bolusing ahead of eating. So you can see like this 10 a.m. Um, section here the patient is bolusing uh, late because their carb entry is late and the glucose has already started to rise. Compared to around um, 8 p.m., their carb entry was done ahead of that rise, and so um, that can help clue you in to how they're doing with the timing. Um, looking more, so of course, the purple line here is the continuous glucose monitoring. The blue half mountain is the bolus doses that they're given. And then if there's a check mark given on that report, it tells you that they gave the dose as advised at least within 0.5 units of the recommended dose versus if they gave a lower amount, it'll have a downward triangle um, versus if they gave a higher um, dose, it would have the upward triangle. And then um, of course it shows the active insulin time, um, which you can see an example for eight o'clock where they initially got two units and then um, additionally, 870 grams of carbs and looked at um, the glucose was higher and it, so it took into account what was still active from the previous dose. So we're going to walk through all these um, steps um, later when we go through the in-pen case, um, but this is what we just even walked through on the report, um, but this is going to be helpful to kind of look through. An example case I just wanted to provide to you first is um, looking at the statistics for this patient uh, in the first circle. So the average glucose for this case is 191. One of the concerning parts is the, low, the lows, which you can see by that red here, and it's 7%. So that's above the target of less than 4%. Uh, the missed doses is pretty excessive, 50 doses. But once again, you wanna 
kind of complete the story by looking at the number of average, average rapid acting insulin doses, which is four and probably pretty reasonable. So potentially this patient just has um, those meal windows not set up right, or maybe they skip a lot of their meals. They're doing a great job using the calculator and feeling confident about the settings. Um, and then that last circle just actually only shows the rapid acting insulin um, dose because they never in their app set up the long acting insulin amount and reminder. And so they're not manually logging that as well. So we don't have any information on that. When looking at the modal um, day glucose, um, we can see that this patient's on a blood glucose meter and see what those trends are. And then below that, we can see that this patient is set up on an insulin to carb ratio um, the carb counting um, mode where their insulin to carb ratio is set to 1 to 14. And then during the day, their target glucose is at 100 versus overnight it's at 140. And then they have a different insulin sensitivity factor during the day versus uh, um, that time period at night as well. So looking further into this case, um, I think starting with the long-acting insulin assessment is a really great place to start because if patients start their day off with a good glucose level, their, the rest of their day is going to go better. And so this often can be an a area to start looking at first. Um, so for this report, it shows 27 of the last 30 days on this report. Um, we don't have a dose, and it shows in the upper left corner of the graph that there's no, it wasn't set up by the app. But even though that's not set up, we can still, the, the app, still analyzes what the glucose was when they went to bed to morning based on the input. And so for this patient, the glucose um, at bedtime is, uh, the median is 151 and then dropping to 110. So of course, glucose fasting of 110 seems good, but that's dropping by 41 milligrams per deciliter. So that's more than that 30, as well as the number of days that they're going low um, has been five. And so there is probably some level of concern for hypoglycemia. Further looking at the meal assessment, um, breakfast overall looks pretty tightly controlled. Um, it'll show what, where they are um, before eating, uh, where they're at at um, hour zero, essentially, and then where the glucose tr is trending post-meal. Um, and so breakfast looks pretty good overall. Lunch, there's definitely um, more variability and tends to rise. And then um, the dinner is definitely all over the board. And once again, to remind you from that statistics section, um, it showed 50 missed doses. You can see that the breakfast um, and all the, the time, time windows for the meals is set pretty tight uh, for an hour and a half time range. And so for breakfast, essentially, if the patient ate at 5.59 or 7.31, that would count as a missed dose. So you need to make sure that time meal window is set appropriately. And when looking at a report, I find a, a very um, useful acronym, DATA. So D is the first data, which we need to have the information to help them. Um, and then the first A is really assessing safety. So of course, we want to look at hypoglycemia. When we're looking at an NPEN report, we can look at the glucose stats in terms of time below range. We can visually look at the modal day graph. And then we can also look at that long acting insulin assessment to see how often they're going below 70, or if that changes by more than 30 points. In terms of the T, that's time and range, and we want to try to make the, the encounter we have with the patient very positive and focus on some of the great things that are happening. And so for this case, the breakfast meal dose seems to be working pretty well. Uh, the second A is the area to improve. Um, so I think there's opportunity to reset the schedule in the app can better match what they're doing. Also probably address the variability at lunch. And then the last A is the action plan. And I think the priority, of course, is to handle the hypoglycemia. So reducing that basal dose would definitely be a recommendation, but then also setting up the basal insulin and the reminder in the app. So that can be um, included on the report as well. And then lastly, adjust the patient schedule in the app to match their current routine. Moving on to the Bigfoot Unity system, there's three major components to it. So there's smart pen cap, there's the mobile app, and then actually it's integrated with the Freestyle Libre 2. So it all comes together in one kind of package. Um, the nice thing is that there is the white pen cap, which is for the rapid acting insulin. 
And so the pen cap replaces the commercial available cap and it's available for mostly all insulins um, that are available. The white pen cap can actually scan the Libre sensors to instead of having to use any other um, device to uh, scan the Libre, as well as there's three bolus options that are available. The one main difference between the intent is it actually doesn't document the number of units administered. So patients can look at the white pen cap and see when they last gave a dose in terms of time, but it will not tell them how much, um, but it will record the next time they do give a dose. The black pen cap is for long acting insulin. So that's nice um, and an advantage over the intent is that there's caps for both types of insulins that our patients are on. Um, and so overall, I think one of the other main differences is the pen caps have to be recharged typically probably every two weeks, um, but they'll last much longer than um, the in pen, which is needs to be replaced after a year. And so with that, I will stop and answer any questions that anyone has about in pen before we move on to exercise. You can also uh, put your questions in chat box. I can read them for you if anyone has questions. Looks like not, Erin. I think you can okay. move forward. Okay, sounds good. So we'll move on to exercise and using um, CGM or continuous glucose monitoring data. I think one of the biggest barriers with our patients exercising is just the fear of lows. And using continuous glucose monitoring has definitely made that a little bit easier. Um, I read this really, I thought, fantastic analogy to mastering exercise is like becoming a good driver. Um, and my daughter is 16 and just got her driver's license last month, so I, that stuck out in my mind. But really, um, you want to try to maintain the right speed um, while you're driving, so the right glucose target. And you need the proper gas, which would be like our food proper break, which the right amount of insulin. Um, and of course, unfortunately, there's not a universal recommendation in terms of how we can advise someone to uh, manage exercise because the type of exercise they're doing um, can be different. And so really the key is for the patients not to give up and to kind of track and see what, what is working well and what is not working well, and essentially take um, a lot of behind the wheel to help, to help master that. So one of the things I think we need to make sure our patients understand is that the lag time with CGM actually increases with exercise. So our typical lag time at rest is around five minutes. With exercise, that can be increased up to 12 to 24 minutes. Um, there's some data, and we use um, BARD, or the mean absolute relative difference, to assess the accuracy of our devices. And there's international guidelines that recommend the MARD to be less than 10%. Uh, the MARD with exercise um, is closer to 14%. So there's definitely some concern there in terms of accuracy because of that lag time. And so the visual here is um, someone riding a bike. Um, and what patients could do is really use a strategy to try to prevent a low by sending, setting their high alert for exercise at a higher level. And so the red line here is the blood glucose and the black line is the sensor glucose. And so if they set their high or their low alert, excuse me, at 100, um, that would be about the time that they actually, their blood is, is going low. And so, you know, that can be individualized based on each patient, but setting a higher alert um, value for the lows would be helpful as well as they could potentially turn that rate of change arrow on um, if they're rapidly dropping um, during exercise as well. There's so many factors that impact glucose um, before, during, and after exercise. So of course, um, you know, if someone's playing tennis versus going for a run and weightlifting and how long they're doing those things impact extra, uh, their glucose, their environment. So if they're running in the heat, um, that can increase insulin absorption and increase the risk for lows. Definitely different bodily concerns. If someone is in a competition level, uh, their counter regulatory hormones can be increased, making their glucose go up. Um, hydration matters. If someone has a history of hypoglycemia, that can impact um, their future risk for, for lows and be uh, worse during exercise. And then, of course, what 
what they're going into exercise with in terms of their glucose level, when they last gave insulin, when they last ate, all of those things play into it. And so there's a lot of things that need to be tracked to kind of help find out what works and what doesn't work. When looking at aerobic exercise, so of course when you can talk but not sing, so walking, cycling, jogging, and swimming, um, these all, all tend to cause glucose for most patients to go down. So if you look at this graph, um, you can see that the muscle um, using glucose um, is the green line, and that's much higher than the blue, which is the, muscle, the glucose production by the liver. And because of that, um, the glucose is definitely dropping. And there's a little bit more of a delayed response with the counter-regulatory counter hormones um, with aerobic activity. And so they don't really help until um, kind of too late at times. Versus anaerobic exercise, so of course, max effort that you can't sustain, so like weightlifting or other types of sprint exercises. Um, and so here, the uh, glucose use by the muscles, which is in green, is much lower than the production by the liver. And then you have a, a more um, significant and sooner response to the counter-regular hormones. And so there, in this scenario, the glucose often rises. In terms of the activity level impact on insulin sensitivity, it's really actually better for our patients to try to get in a very regular routine of almost daily exercise because then they're gonna have more uh, predictable response in terms of their insulin sensitivity versus you can see in pink here when they're maybe exercising two to three days a week, how it's definitely more variable. There are, um, There is now a position statement looking at the use of CGM during exercise. And so we're gonna walk through on the next few slides a lot of the tips that go through um, and kind of pearls of how to help our patients manage exercise. So in terms of before exercise, of course, taking into account the type of exercise they're doing, the intensity, the duration, time of day in relation to the meals that they're eating or the bolus doses that they have given, how much insulin is on board is important as well as what kind of target glucose they're looking for. And that should be individualized based on their risk of lows and then where they're trending um, based on that CGM trend arrow as well. So there's guidelines recommending where the glucose level should be before exercise. And ideally, probably for most patients, between 126 and 180 is reasonable to start anaerobic or aerobic exercise. You can see on the chart that that's highlighted in green, meaning go. Uh, if their glucose is low, um, so less than 125, um, it's probably still fine to start anaerobic activity, but aerobic activity that's going to make their glucose go down, they probably need to consume a small amount of carbs. And then, of course, if they're less than 90, um, they probably need a little bit more uh, carb intake and need to make sure that their glucose has come up before uh, starting their activity. And if they're using a pump, they could make sure that they definitely have a temp target or even suspend insulin if needed. Um, for anaerobic activity, if they're low, they may be able to just treat with a little bit of carbs and may start that exercise potentially because they are going to expect their glucose to rise with that activity. If the glucose is high um, before exercise, definitely if it's above 270, they might will benefit from checking ketones and maybe even need a correction dose um, if they're doing aerobic activity. If they're participating in anaerobic activity, it's probably best definitely to avoid knowing that the glucose is going to continue to rise. So in terms of the thresholds to consider to carb up before exercise, and just in general, I think that really has to do with where their risk of hypoglycemia is. So once again, 126 to 180 is the general rule, um, and maybe patients that are at lower risk for hypoglycemia want to start towards the lower end of that target. Um, if patients have moderate risk of hypoglycemia, maybe starting more towards the middle of 145 to 180. And then if they're at higher risk, um, have a lot of history of lows, they're older adults, a lot of chronic medical conditions, probably want to start much higher, 161 to 180. And so they really can, should be able with time to figure out how many carbs they need to consume and how much impact a certain amount of carbs increases their uh, glucose by. 
So during exercise, similar glucose targets to whatever they would be targeting pre-exercise. Um, during exercise, of course, if they do go low, if someone's on a pump, the nice option is to be able to suspend the insulin. Um, if someone goes below 54, they should suspend and probably not restart the exercise activity. If they're just reaching a slightly below 126, but seems reasonable, they could consider the amount of carbs based on that trend arrow. Um, and then once again, really changing that low alert during exercise. If someone's more concerned, they could even um, raise that low alert all the way up to 126. That way they can um, react to it by in consuming some carbs versus having to stop their exercise, which is definitely frustrating. If someone has the opposite response and maybe they're doing anaerobic activity and their glucose is going up, um, maybe they need a corrective dose and it's probably advised to give 50% of that corrective dose. After exercise is also a time to monitor really closely, especially during the first 90 minutes after exercise. Um, probably okay to have the glucose go down to a target level between 80 and 100 for most patients. Maybe that's higher if they're higher risk for lows. And then um, they may need to ingest the carbs after exercise or even um, adjust the insulin amount that they're giving at the, at the next meal, um, as well as potentially set a low alert to be higher um, overnight because some patients experience delayed um, onset hypoglycemia where six to 12 hours later, they're having the impact from their activity causing the low. And so after that exercise, maybe they need a smaller amount of insulin for carbs or some free snacks um, following that activity. Some patients experience the post-workout um, rise in their glucose, and so some of the reasons for that could be delayed food digestion. Exercise can definitely slow um, the digestion, um, and glucose might not get into the blood until the activity is over, and so they can kind of have a double whammy um, of a low during the exercise because they injected insulin, but the food isn't absorbed yet, and then it ends up going high after exercise. So, Ideally, if it's option for that patient to kind of schedule their exercise and not have that meal before, that's probably the most ideal scenario. But if they do eat something, trying to take that into account. Some patients, we have a lot of them that give excess carbs um, when they're experiencing a lower trending low, and so maybe they need to fine tune that carb supplementation. Really need to evaluate the exercise type. So if it's something that's causing their glucose to go up, maybe they need to start at a lower target. Uh, with those latent stress hormones, some patients might need a bolus. I've had a spin instructor that had a significant rise with um, teaching a spin class and so needed that post-workout bolus. And then suspending insulin also, sometimes people are suspending it for too long and that's really definitely causing um, lows um, later on. And so limiting that suspension or maybe doing a temp rate it would be better if they're using an insulin pump. I think sometimes people can also use exercise as a, as a way to improve glucose um, control. I think it's one of probably our most underrated treatment strategies. And so if someone has a high post meal, I think having that as an opportunity to go out for a walk, you're gonna get a, they're gonna get a better response than actually um, correcting with insulin and it's gonna correct their glucose probably faster. And so there's some data that shows for most patients, a 30 minute casual walk on flat ground at an average pace can reduce the um, glucose by one milligram per deciliter per minute. So if they're starting at 150, getting that down to 120. Uh, someone that may be doing a steep walk up hills or uh, average pace that's much quicker, maybe that changes by two milligrams per deciliter per minute. So 150 down to 90. Um, and so using exercise in that capacity to help with those post-meal highs can be beneficial as well. The opportunities that we have, and we kind of discussed some of this already, but really is really adjusting insulin. I think trying to use insulin adjustments are, is most ideal for a lot of our patients because some patients really get frustrated and decide not to exercise because they don't want to add more calories because they're trying to exercise for their health, but also maybe weight loss and trying to reduce calorie amount. And so it can be frustrating and feel like it defeats the purpose. And so really evaluating their mealtime bolus. And so ahead of um, exercise, if they are eating, maybe they need to reduce bolus 
Um, so they have less insulin on board. Also evaluating their um, bolus post-exercise um, when insulin action is increased, maybe that needs to be adjusted, as well as the basal insulin. Um, patients that are using injections could reduce the basal by 25% at their next dose, or with using an insulin pump, they can adjust that basal rate um, depending upon, um, you know, ahead of, of the exercise, during and after, and maybe the evening of um, even run at a lower rate of like 25% uh, below their normal. In terms of these basal um, reductions, there's definitely a lot of data that suspension um, the insulin pumps can lead to um, kind of delayed hyperglycemia later. And so taking into account um, and trying to focus more on maybe basal reductions um, and their rates is probably better than full suspension. Um, if they do suspend, probably for a shorter period of time. Of course, a lot of this is easier to figure out if patients can have planned exercise, and that's not realistic for everyone. Um, but if something is unplanned or tends to be shorter, maybe a more significant reduction in the basal rate would be appropriate versus something that's planned or extended duration. Um, trying to get that basal rate reduced ahead of the exercise so that they're seeing the impact earlier um, and maybe not reducing it by as much. In terms of patients that are on automated insulin delivery pumps, some of the rules that we kind of just talked about may change a little bit. And so I wanted to highlight those on the next few slides. So we have some pumps that are available that have predictive low glucose suspend systems. So that will suspend insulin once it gets to that low or predicted to go um, low. And so that's the tandem basal IQ and then the Minimed 630G. And then we have the automated insulin or AID systems, which is the Minimed 670, 770, and then the T-SLIM X2 control IQ. And so the pumps will decrease or suspend basal insulin for low glucose or trending lows. And so these tend to be um, not as effective during exercise since the patient's insulin sensitivity is much higher. Uh, these algorithms tend to work better for the overnight or that delayed onset hypoglycemia, as well as if someone has a response as long as it's not too significant to where they're getting a slight post-exercise rise, the algorithm tends to work pretty well as well. So for the Miniman 670G, 770G, what a patient would do is turn on what's called a temp target. So the algorithm targets a glucose of 150 instead of 120. And the nice feature with the Medtronic is that they can set the duration for that time target up to 12 hours. And so um, they can turn it on and then set that time and then it automatically goes back to the usual target of 120 after that program time. Versus the T-SLIM, um, it's called exercise activity. The algorithm usually targets between 112.5 and 160, but if they turn on exercise activity, it targets between 140 and 160. I think one of the downsides, and hopefully one of the next software upgrades will address this, but they have to remember to turn off the exercise activity, um, which, you know, maybe some people forget to do. The one other opportunity, especially if someone has a very active job, maybe the days that they work, they turn on the exercise profile, and that would be another way to manage that, where their basal rates are set differently or even their correction factor. Um, in terms of using uh, automated insulin delivery pumps, it's really important to emphasize that our patients turn on these exercise settings well in advance to their activity if the activity is going to make their glucose go down. Um, so 60, 120 minutes, which I know is not always easy to plan for, but if someone has planned exercise, that would be a recommendation. Um, and then potentially they may need to keep that exercise activity on for longer periods of time if they're seeing some delayed onset lows. And then if the glucose does rise, like I said, most of these systems work pretty well to manage um, the lows, but if, or the highs, excuse me, but if the dose, a uh, correction dose may be needed if the uh, glucose is trending high greater than 30 minutes after the exercise and the trend arrows are showing it's continuing to go up. Um, they may need a correction dose, which I would recommend definitely a lower correction dose if possible, particularly with the tandem where um, the target is 110. And so if the, the correction dose comes out to be, say, six units, maybe they man manually reduce that to three. Medtronic, uh, you cannot manually decrease, but 
it's not as much of a concern because the target glucose that that algorithm uses is to target the glucose of 150 when they're giving a correction. So in terms of meal timing, of course, ideal option would be to eat greater than um, three hours before the start of any prolonged exercise. And if they do need to eat before a meal, trying to maybe consider having a lower carb or lower glycemic food um, meal, or they may need to enter less carbs into their pump or manually adjust the amount that they're getting um, for that bolus uh, before exercise. One big difference, I think, as people uh, change from traditional insulin pumps to these automated insulin delivery systems is they may have figured out exercise on their previous pump, and a lot of those rules can change when they're on these types of systems because some people have regularly where they um, try to pre-carb ahead of time. And so if they do that, depending on the timing, the system doesn't know that they're exercising and the glucose um, will be rising and the algorithm starts to increase the basal rate. Um, if they're on tandem, it will also potentially give an automated correction bolus. And so then the patient has more insulin on board uh, potentially making that low be more significant. And so if possible, it's best to avoid carbs unless, of course, their glucose is too low before starting, then they would need to um, go ahead and treat with um, some carbs. Um, and then if they're doing an activity that's more prolonged, trying to consume smaller amounts um, intermittently would be the best option. So uh, type 1 diabetes exercise um, case study that I wanted to review uh, was a 20-year-old female with type 1 since age 16 using CGM, time and range 55%, time below 5%, so a little um, more often than, than we'd like to see, on a basal bolus insulin regimen, no regular physical activity except biking to class and some walking, wants to sign up for a 5K, plans to run four times a week, also wants to consider losing weight and keep the glucose under tight control, but does have a history of fear of lows. So some really key strategies when we're evaluating um, someone trying to exercise is trying to help them figure out what their risk is for lows, and that'll help, to help them determine what they're trying to target their glucose to be before, during, and after exercise. So the patient that I just discussed, she's 20, so she's younger, um, but doesn't regularly exercise, so that can have an impact on um, increasing her risk for lows, as well as 5% of the time she's going below target range. And so maybe she's more at a moderate um, risk for hypoglycemia at this point. And so maybe her target glucose before and during exercise should be more towards starting at 145 um, to 180. And then if she, with that fear of lows, maybe the low glucose alarm should be changed to 126 or maybe at least 100. Since she wants to lose weight, um, really trying to work with the insulin adjustments, if she can schedule her running um, to a time where she isn't eating before, that would be ideal. But if she does, she may need to have the pre-meal bolus be reduced um, and then also monitor what, what's happening post-exercise to see if there's a lower amount of bolus needed after as well as lower that basal rate in the evening. In terms of food adjustments, um, if she can work with the insulin to make it work, that would be ideal to help meet her goals. But of course, if she's low before exercise, um, she's gonna need some carbs and base that off of the glucose and, and that trend arrow. Um, and then monitor that, of course, during the activity and post-exercise. Making sure she's eating the right types of food and meal composition after exercise would also be important. And with that, I will also see if anyone has any questions before we break into our group um, to go over a couple cases. While we wait uh, for questions on the other, uh, on the uh, latest topic, I think there was a question on um, what are the criteria for in-pen to be covered by insurance? So, um, I don't know of any insurance having any set criteria like we have with CGM where they have to monitor a certain amount of days or be on a certain number of injections, so nothing like that. Um, there is a program called Relay Health, which for most insurances can help get the cost down to $35 for an in-pen, um, and that's one of the reasons why within the endocrine clinic I had set up to order that through our freighter pharmacies and have the prior office team help us with that because there's some – 
kind of paperwork and um, things that need to be done to make that happen. Medicaid actually just started covering the in-pen, which is excellent. There's some patients with Medicare that have their, depending upon the plan, it might give some coverage, but then it's still the out-of-pocket cost is like three or $400, which is not, um, you know, patients can't afford. And there's no opportunities with that subgroup of patients to do anything to help them. Um, but commercial patients often can get it for, for sure, $35. Thank you. Anyone else has any other questions?